Hi, this is Grandmaster Maurice of Flores, and this is the first video in my series on the closed King's Indian pawn structures. In my book, Chess Structures, these structures are called the King's Indian Type 1, Type 2, and Type 3. Now, let's see what it is we are talking about by showing a simple variation. Uh, so let's start with d4, knight f6, okay. And, uh, okay, so after e5, we have reached one of the most common positions in the King's Indian defense. And now, if white decides to push with d5, we will definitely be playing a closed King's Indian structure. That is the topic of this video series. Now, black has to make a big decision. What should he do with this pawn on c7? He could, for example, decide to play c6 and then maybe white castles and then pawn takes, pawn takes, and we have reached the King's Indian type 1 structure, which is characterized by having an open c file. So that's one alternative. Second alternative, maybe black will instead decide to play c5. And in this case, and then we will have a King's Indian type 2 structure. And uh, finally, the third option might be if black decides to play a5 instead. In this case, he might want to follow with something like knight a6, knight e8, I don't know, f5. The pawn will stay on c7, and this is what we call a King's Indian type 3 structure. So, in this first video, we will be learning how to play the King's Indian type 1 structure from white's perspective. Now, let's see the first example. The game started with a usual sequence. We have reached the King's Indian type 1 structure, the C file is open, and as of right now it seems like both sides could potentially fight to control it. Now let's see a few more moves. Now this move is standard, but you know, it might seem a little bit strange. The point is that black will likely play h5 and h4 sooner or later, so the knight has to go somewhere. Now, a few more moves. And now if you're looking at this, you might be thinking that white doesn't really know what he's doing, since notice that he played knight e2, g3, f1, and then d2. You know, it took him four moves to get to d2, when in reality, I mean, he could have done something pretty similar by just playing knight f3, in uh, 92 to begin with. You know, maybe that would have been faster. But that doesn't mean that black is doing poorly. I mean, just notice something. Black decided to play c6 and take on d5. And, uh, you know, oftentimes white has to go through a lot of trouble in order to achieve that trade. For example, you know, in other positions, white actually might play b4, c5 and take on d6, which just amounts to the same pawn structure. So, all I want to say here is that this position shouldn't be evaluated in terms of whether we wasted a move here or there, but rather just look at the present position and think whether the key plans can be achieved. In this position, both sides might want to fight for the C file. And it actually seems like white is doing quite well because he seems to be a little bit better prepared to do that. Now, here black played b5, but let's for a moment consider what would have happened if he had just continued to play in the king side with f5. My guess is that he decided not to play this because then maybe white could transform the central pawn structure by trading pawns on f5, then playing knight c4, attacking the d6 pawn, which is a little bit weak, and then, well, there is queen f6, a4, then, you know, we want to secure the c4 square, that's why we play a4, kind of prevents b5, and now black can continue with bishop h6, we trade, and a5. White has a pleasant advantage on the queen side. You know, he has more space, he has secured important squares, the d6 pawn is a little bit weak, and uh, it will be hard for black to achieve something concrete in the center or the king side. Notice that the center pawns on e5 and uh, f5 are actually pretty good. You know, they cover many important squares, like these four squares cannot be used. But the moment that black decides to do something with these pawns, like push forward, then holes are created. For example, if we play f4, then suddenly the e4 square is pretty weak and a knight might use it very easily. This is not very nice. So this is why white is better. Now, going back a few moves, 
in the game Black decided to play b5. And well, you know, he's trying to accomplish two different things. Number one, he probably wants to keep white from playing knight c4. That's clear. And the second thing is that he probably wants to fight for the c file, and the way that he's probably thinking is to play knight b6, bishop b7, and then put a rook on c8. So that would make sense, but unfortunately for him, he will not really have the time to do that, because white is able to attack the b5 pawn pretty soon. Now, there is two possibilities. First, we might consider what happens if we just go against it right away. We play a4. Well, this is not good at all, since after b4, knight a2, a5, black's queen side, the pawns are just very hard to attack. I mean, how are we, are we supposed to even try to attack this pawn on a5? It's not very easy. I still might prefer white a little bit, but the advantage, if there is any, is not a serious advantage at all. So that was not a good attempt. It makes a lot more sense to play actually b4. And the reason that we play that is that we keep that pawn on b5 fixed. And the next move is going to be very natural. We are just going to push a4 and, you know, the attack will just roll very easily. I believe that in the game, Black probably underestimated how powerful this idea would be. Now, Black played bishop f6, but let's for a moment consider. In case of knight b6, what could we have done? In this position, white can just play the natural a4. Okay, we trade. And in this position, white is ready to win a pawn right away. For example, if we play f5, then b5. The a6 pawn is lost. Going back a couple moves, maybe black can try bishop b7. But then white can play knight c4, and you know white is ready to just make a bunch of very natural moves like castle, queen a1, knight a5, and again, it seems like the a6 pawn cannot be defended, and in fact, I can guarantee you that pawn is going to be lost very soon and very easily. So going back just a few moves, black decided to play bishop f6. Now a4, bishop g5, and uh, now white has to decide whether, whether to trade or not. Suppose he took on g5. This is not a very good decision, as we will see. Notice, first of all, that the g2 pawn is now under attack. And uh, if we want to protect it, I mean, we might be thinking about castle, but now queen e3, suddenly the knight is lost. We cannot allow that. Now, white might still be able to play queen f2 and keep everything under control, so to speak. But, I mean, this is not an ideal way to play. I mean, first of all, we have space advantage. And, uh, you know, trading pieces is not really favorable for us. Now, in addition to that, the king is now a little bit exposed. So, going back, it made a lot more sense, and it was quite a natural move when white decided to play bishop f2. And something that I would like to remember from this uh, video is that the bishop is extremely well placed in this diagonal when we have the king's Indian type 1 structure. This is a very recurring idea. You know, this almost guarantees white an advantage. Now, uh, well, the b5 pawn is still under attack, so now black took. And, uh, well, white could have taken the pawn on a4 right away, but he decided to just go with knight c4 instead. You know, because there is no hurry. The d6 pawn is under attack. So black now played queen e7, queen takes a4. The queen is coming to c6, and then the d6 pawn will be lost, so. Black had to play bishop b7. And okay, so white finally castled, and uh, his queenside play went exactly the way he could have hoped for. The a6 pawn is extremely weak, and so is the c6 square. I mean, notice. The knight can easily come to a5 and pursue both targets. You know, this is a very nice position for white. Now, you know, black will not be able to hold this for very long, so let's see how the game continued. Rook c8. Queen b3, knight a5. Now we have to be careful. I mean, at first it might be tempting to just take on b7. You know, rook takes c3 and then queen a4. Now, the a6 pawn is falling, which is nice. But something that I want you to notice is that here the position got a little bit disorganized. So, yeah, this is good for white. It's just not optimal. If you have a big advantage, 
you shouldn't be entirely happy with this because you have an even bigger advantage a few times ago. And uh, here in this position, after rook c8, white found a very strong move, knight c6 instead. So this blocks the c file, keeps both rooks inactive. And of course, the knight can be captured, but if black decides to do that, then he will lose his light squared bishop, and then the light squares will be extremely weak. So let's consider that for a moment. Bishop takes c6, I take, you take the knight d5. The queen has to go away. So queen e8 and now bishop takes a6. And uh, black is definitely going to lose some material here. For example, after rook b8, white can play queen a4. The rook is in the air. We might try to protect it with knight df8, but now bishop b5. And uh, well, white is winning an exchange, but the bigger issue here is that even after he takes the exchange, he's still winning by a lot just because this pawn on b4 can roll down the b file very easily. So the game is just over. Now let's go back a few moves. Black probably realized that taking the knight was not very promising, so instead he decided to play queen e8. Now white gets to take the pawn, bishop takes, rook takes, and knight b8. This is probably the move that black was hoping for. And uh, first of all, Let's consider what happens after knight takes. This actually fails because of the intermediate move rook takes c3, queen b2, black can't take the knight just yet because the rook on c3 would be hanging, right? So instead black has to play rook c2, queen b3, and now rook takes f2, rook takes f2, and rook b8. Black is a lot better, you know, he has two pieces for the pawn and actually well, the b4 pawn is not very likely to go very far. So going back just a few moves. White in this position played rook a7. And after knight takes e6, he traded a few things. And uh, this position is very dominant. I mean, as you can see, we have an imbalance in the pawn structure. White has a very powerful outside passer. Black, on the other hand, has a very weak d6 pawn. The knight is also very powerful. So, I mean, obviously, this is a great position for white, and eventually he won. This is just not the best way he could have played, though. So, let's go back. After knight b8, white had a wonderful move, b5, which really would have made everything perfect in this game. Now, he supports the knight and the rook, and the only way that black can continue hoping to, you know, fight here is to take the rook, to accept the exchange sacrifice. But now, you know, his position is so dominant with white that this is just an easy win. For example, I mean, if black tries to give up the exchange back right away, then rook takes, pawn take, queen take, and now a7. The knight on c3 cannot be taken because somebody has to stay to cover that promotion. And since black cannot do that, then white will just continue with knight d5, rook a1, and this is just going to be a very easy win. So going back a few moves, after pawn takes, you know, the knight cannot be taken, and, uh, well, black might try to survive by playing rook a8, and here we're just making progress. So, a7, we might be thinking about rook b1, queen b8, so then black has to stop that somehow. But in stopping that, other things become more vulnerable. And now after knight b5, notice that the d6 pawn is very weak. And in this position, everything in black's position just collapses. I mean, there is no way to defend everything. So here black could have resigned very easily. Just to remind you, the game didn't go this way. White played a slightly less precise move earlier on, but he won anyway. Now, let's see the next example. Now, in the last game, one could say that black was really naive in his decision to push this b5, right? I mean, and then white just fixed the weakness and then attacked it very easily. So here we will see how black could stay away from that plan and then how white can still play for a win in a convincing manner. So let's see the opening. Okay, we have reached a very popular position. And now a line that used to be played quite often was c5, then pawn take, take on e5, 
sacrifice a pawn in knight g5. This is a very complicated position. There's a lot of theory. In this game though, white decided to go for a more positional route by playing d5. And then after knight c5, queen e2, pawns were traded, and again, we have king's indian type 1 structure. Now, black decided to just continue development and start fighting for the c file right away. White does the same thing. And now an interesting idea for black might have been to play queen d8, and then maybe I will play knight d2, and uh, queen f8 deserves consideration. The idea of this is, well, first of all, you know, white is going to play knight c4 sooner or later, so the queen here kind of gives protection to the pawn, but then also it prepares bishop h6 to try to trade something and alleviate the space advantage. And, uh, well, now white could just play rook c2, double rooks, and, uh, well, I mean, white's position is definitely preferable here. Black's probably not going to pull a powerful kingside attack, and meanwhile, you know, white has got decent prospects in the queenside. So, well, that was one possibility. Another thing black could have tried to do after knight d2 was rook c7, hoping to double. But then I can just play with white knight b5 right away. And then after rook c8, you know, it doesn't really seem like black can do much with the open file. So white can just continue to increase his space advantage. And uh, he has to be careful in the way he does this, though. For example, if he plays b4, then a6. I would really like to place my queen on e2, but then after knight a4, you know, this is the type of position that black would enjoy. I mean, the knight got inside the game, now maybe he will play knight to c3, or the rook will come to c2. Either way, black is doing okay here. Instead, white could play after rook a c8, a4. And notice that now he's threatening b4 because the a4 square is covered. Now, if we manage to play b4, suddenly the a7 pawn is going to be in serious danger. So black can try something like a6. I go away with my queen. I'm playing b4 anyway, right? They're just trying to push back that knight. And uh, the way black might respond is a5. But now I, I just go back with queen b5. And black's position is quite unpleasant. So, well, let's go back several moves then. You know, the idea of playing queen d8 seems quite reasonable because it gets away from this diagonal. I think you remember from the previous example that white's dark squared bishop is really well placed in this diagonal. And perhaps one of the reasons is that it just makes black's play so much harder. Now, something that white probably has in mind at this moment is to put a rook on b1 and play b4. This is unpleasant. So, black decided to play a5. This way he kind of claims some space on the queen side and gets ahead of white's threat of playing b4. Now let's see how white continued. Knight d2. This is where problems begin for black. You know, first of all, everything begins with a little tactical detail. Black might want to take on b2, but he can't, because after rook b1 and knight c4, the queen is trapped. Now, let's go back a couple more moves and say, well, what if he goes away now, queen d8? Then after knight b5, I'm attacking the d6 pawn, right? Black might play queen e7, but now white can destroy black's pawn structure by taking on c5. And then securing a square for the knight. Now, this pawn structure is, you know, quite pleasant for white unless black is able to fight for the d6 square with a knight. So, kind of the only move that we should consider here is knight e8, hoping to get to d6 at some point. Now, after knight c4, we are threatening to go to b6. And then black can play queen d8, I can play queen b2, b6, and now black is ready. He's threatening to equalize by taking on b5 and then placing a knight on d6. But then white can get ahead of that and play d6. And this is a pretty solid advantage. You know, this is not something that black wants to play. So let's go back and see what happened in the game. After knight d2, white had this idea of going to c4, and he also had an, an idea of going to b3, 
to take on c5. So black played a4 to prevent that. And now white came up with a nice idea. He played b3. Now, the idea of playing b3 is that if black were to take, now we can take with the knight, we will take on c5, and this will be favorable for white. Let's see an example. Queen c7, okay. We trade. And now again, we, we have this idea that black will probably be okay if he can rearrange his pieces effectively by placing a knight in the right square and maybe pushing b5. If black could accomplish those two things, then his position would be quite okay. So we have to get ahead of that. Rook b1. Now black can play bishop f8, you know, give some protection to c5. Now queen b2. And now uh, we are attacking the b7 pawn. Here, black can play rook b8, and uh, if he could play b5, he, everything would be okay. With white, we get ahead of that, and we play queen b6 ourselves. This move secures a very nice square for the queen, or maybe the rook after that, but also keeps the b7 and c5 pawns separated from each other. That's the key in this position. And uh, after knight e8, well, I mean, we're not going to let the knight ever go to d6. I mean, at least not so easily, so we take, take, and then insist. Rook b6, with a very nice advantage. We can see how powerful the d5 pawn is, how weak the c5 pawn is. Right, so everything is going well for white. It is understandable that black wouldn't like to play this position. Now, let's go back a few moves. After b3, black decided to play queen a6. And now white just traded. The last several moves were kind of forced, and now white played rook c1, attacking the bishop. Now, if black tried to go back with the rook, then suddenly knight c4 wins, because he's attacking d6, and when you try to protect it, knight b6 wins a piece right away. So this is not acceptable. That's why after rook c1, black had nothing better than to play bishop d7, and when we play knight c4, attacking d6, black has to play rook a6. For a moment, let's consider what would happen after bishop f8? Now, notice that, you know, this rook is kind of vulnerable, the bishop is vulnerable, and actually white can just play bishop g5. And uh, once the knight is gone, knight b6 is winning material. So this is not okay either. So after knight c4, black played rook a6, knight b6, and uh, here we have an interesting moment. Black could have taken on a2. And then, obviously, I mean, white is going to get the pawn back in this way. Typically, the more pawns we trade, the closer we are to a draw. And if all the pawns in one flank are gone, then most likely the result is going to be a complete draw. But here we have an exception. The game is pretty simplified and almost symmetrical. The only real difference is this d5 pawn against the d6 pawn. Now, that is a difference that I want you to remember. That one little difference means that white in every position will have some substantial space advantage that will make everything a little bit easier for him. And in this particular position, it amounts to being winning. Let me just give you kind of a long variation to illustrate this point. So, I mean, black can kind of put some obstacles, kind of delay the game by attacking the bishop and moving around. But nothing much happens. I mean, he doesn't have much to do. So he just kind of moves around, and little by little, white gets a little bit closer to the goal. Now, uh, notice that, you know, the bishop is coming to e8 now. This is just not looking nice. And, uh, well, black can stop it by playing rook a8. And then, you know, the d6 pawn is going to be lost. And once the d6 pawn is lost, the d5 pawn is just too powerful. The game is won. So let's go back several moves. What we were showing in this ending is how the space advantage can amount to a, a very convincing win for white. That is why black didn't dare to take on a2, and uh, instead he played h6. Now white found a very nice move, a4. And suddenly you notice this rook is getting trapped. I mean, we're going to play something like 
bishop f1 and rook c7 and meanwhile the rook is just sitting out of the game so in this position black took on a4 and after bishop f1 well the bishop is lost for example rook a7 rook a1 the bishop on a4 is lost because of the pin to avoid that black decided to give up an exchange by taking the knight but after rook c7 he decided that it was best to just resign because now the b7 pawn is going to be lost and then after bishop c7 probably the d6 pawn is also going to be lost okay overall i hope you've enjoyed this first video the main idea that i want you to get is that in the type 1 king's indian uh, closest structure we have a fight for the c-file and this fight is one that white is more likely to win just because of the space so this is something to bear in mind white has a very substantial space advantage it's hard for black to fight back